welcome back to my channel. If you are visiting my channel for the first time, I say you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we would be looking at the sternoclavicular joint. As I've always said on this channel, it's for us to always break down the name. If you break down the name, you see that this joint exists between the sternum and also the clavicle. And this is why it is so referred to as the sternoclavicular joint. Let's say this is where we have the sternum. We know that the sternum can also be referred to as the breastbone. And at this point here, we have the clavicle. Specifically, we have the standard hand of the clavicle. And these two bones will come together to create a joint that is referred to as the sternoclavicular joint. Look down with me in this lecture, where we'll be highlighting the structure of the sternoclavicular joint, also describing the different ligaments that help to reinforce this joint. We'll also be describing some details that you should know as students of anatomy. can also be referred to as the SC joints, which means sternoclavicular joints. It is a strong and also a compact joint. We would be describing, as we go through with this lecture, what features make this joint a strong joint and also what contributes to it being a compact type of joint. We say that these joints occur between the sternum and also the clavicle. But there are specific regions of these two bones that contributes to the formation of this joint. And this is what this slide will be unfolding. If you use this upper image, this is where we have the sternoclavicular joint here, carried at this point. This joint is specifically between the standard end of the clavicle. This is where we have the standard end of the clavicle. If you go back to our lecture on the clavicle, remember in that lecture, we described that the clavicle is the only horizontally placed long bone and long bones are seen to have a shaft and also two ends. And in the clavicle, this hand, where this arrow is pointing, is the standard hand. This standard hand is sternal because it is the hand that is related to the sternum. This hand can also be referred to as the medial hand, while the other hand at the lateral region is the lateral hand or the acromial hand. This hand, we say, is the hand that is related to the acromion of the scapula. We've described this in details in our lecture on the clavicle. If not check up that lecture, please kindly go and do so. So going back to the standard hand here, this is the specific region of the clavicle that contributes to the formation of the sternoclavicular joint. And at this region here is where we have the mandibrum. Specifically, we have the clavicular notch of the mandibrum. This is an indentation that is created on the superior lateral region of the mandibrum. And this is what receives the standard hand of the clavicle. So we have a notch created at this region that is an indentation that receives the standard or the medial hand of the clavicle in forming the sternoclavicular joint. If we go back to our lecture on the sternum, Remember, we said that the sternum is divided into three sub-regions. And using this alignment created here in dotted black, at this upper region here is where we have the manubrum. And inferior to the manubrum, we have the body of the sternum. And most inferior region, which is the tip, is referred to as the sinusoid process. It is on the manubrum that we have the creation of the clavicular notch. Remember, the manubrum is the most superior region. And since this joint is created at this superior hand, we should expect that it is the manubrum that will create this clavicular notch, which is an indentation that receives the standard hand of the clavicle. So it is specifically on the manubrum that will have the clavicular notch created. So it is important that we describe the specific regions of this bone that contributes to the formation of this joint. This joint is classified as a subdual type of synovial joint, and we would be describing the details behind this classification. We know that saddle joint basically is formed from articulating surface that projects concave and convex alignment. And it is also a joint that allows movement in two directions, which is a biaxial type of movement. So if you try to use this lower image at this point, this is where we have the standard hand of the clavicle, and this is where we have the clavicular notch here of the manubrum. We already described in detail these specific regions that contribute to the formation of the sternoclavicular joint. If you go back to the standard hand of the clavicle, you see that it creates a concave convex alignment, and it does this along its vertical and also horizontal axis. If you look at this alignment that is created here in dotted black, 
This is the longitudinal alignment here of the standard head of the clavicle. And at this point, we have a convex presentation. If you go to the anterior posterior dimension of this standard head, we have a concave alignment. This kind of presentation is also exhibited by the clavicular notch of the manubrum. This is where we have the clavicular notch of the manubrum and also its vertical alignment also creates a concave alignment. So you have a convex presentation along the anterior posterior dimension. So it is expected that the standard end of the clavicle will be able to fit perfectly into the clavicular notch of the manubrum. This is what is expected. But this does not happen because the standard end of the clavicle is bigger than the clavicular notch that is created on the manubrum. So at this upper region, a chunk of the standard end of the clavicle is seen to be protruding out of space because the space that is created by this indentation created by the clavicular notch of the manubrum does not fully accommodate the standard end of the clavicle. Joint cavity with them would that be lined by the synovial membrane. And this is why you need a number of ligaments that will be helping to reinforce this joint. As we go through with this lecture, we'll be highlighting the ligaments that are involved in helping to reinforce or support this joint. So let's try and describe the anatomy or the morphology of this joint. First, let's look at the articular surfaces. We have three articular surfaces in the creation of the sternoclavicular joint. And these surfaces are seen to be lined by a fibrocartilage. And this makes it different from the other type of synovial joint that are seen to be lined by a link type of cartilage. We know that fibrocartilages are seen in regions that are needed to provide tensile support and also strength. And this is one of the factors that contribute to the strength of this joint. And this is why we say that this joint is a strong type of joint. So let's try and look at the articular surfaces. One of the articular surfaces is the standard end of the clavicle, and this should come easy as we highlighted this in our previous slide. This is where we have the standard end of the clavicle here. We say that this standard hand is the hand that is related to the sternum, and this is where it is so referred to as the standard hand of the clavicle. And this is what contributes to the formation of the sternoclavicular joint. The acromial hand is at the other lateral end, and this is where the clavicle connects with the acromion of the scapula. The next is the clavicular notch. The clavicular notch of the manubrum also is one of the articular surfaces of this joint. And this is what is harrowed there at this point. We say that there is an indentation that is created on the superior lateral region of the manubrum. And this is what receives the standard hand of the clavicle in creating the sternoclavicular joint. We also have a contributing articular surface to this joint and this is the first costal cartilage, and specifically the upper region of the first costal cartilage is what contributes to the formation of this joint. And this is what is harrogate at this point. Remember that the first costal cartilage is the anterior continuation of the first rib. We say that ribs are not connected directly to the sternum, but are connected through the costal cartilages. We've also tried to highlight this in our previous lecture on the costal cartilage, if you don't check that lecture or please also kindly go and do so. So this is where we have the anterior continuation of the first rib that is formed by the costal cartilage. So specifically, it is the upper region of the first costal cartilage that also contributes to the formation of this joint. I will be describing in details as we go through this slide how the first costal cartilage also contributes to the formation of this joint. Remember we said in our previous slide that the sternoclavicular joint is a joint that exists between the standard end of the clavicle and also the clavicular notch of the manubrum of the sternum, where it is seen to receive a contributory support from the first postal cartilage. It is important that we highlight this in case we are asked during examination. So let's drive further here where we'll be describing the intraarticular disc. There is an intraarticular disc that is located within the joint space, and this is formed by a fibrocartilage. And this is specifically to absorb shock. If you go back to how the orientation of the skeletal framework is, you see that the clavicle connects the appendicular skeleton to the axial skeleton. It is what connects the upper limb specifically to the sternum. It's intraarticular disc to absorb shock from the upper limb region down to the axial skeleton. And it is also important for us to highlight the alignment of this disc. The intraarticular disc is seen to run from the standard end here of the clavicle 
and it is seen to descend inferiorly where it is finally inserted on the superior border or superior surface of the first coastal cartilage. And this is why we say that the first coastal cartilage also contributes to the formation of this joint. The connection at the inferior region of the intraarticular disc is what brings the first coastal cartilage into this joint. And it is to prevent the displacement of the clavicle. So it is seen to help reinforce this joint also furthermore. This is where we have the intraarticular disc here, arrowed in dotted red. As you can see, it is seen to run from the clavicle at this upper region, and you see it descending down where it is finally inserted on the superior or the upper surface of the first coastal cartilage. This intraarticular disc is seen to exhibit anatomical and physiological function. The anatomical function basically is the fact that it divides this joint capsule into two. While in this region, you see one cavity, and at the other hand here, you see another cavity. This is what it does to this joint capsule structurally. Physiologically, it helps to transform the biaxial form of movement that is exerted by the saddle type of joint into an allowance of movement that is created by a ball and socket type of joint. It describes that this joint is classified as a saddle type of synovial joint. And it is saddled because of the articular surfaces that create a concave converse alignment and also allow a biaxial movement. But because of the placement of the intraarticular disc here, it is able to allow for a wider range of movement. And this is where it is being transformed for a biaxial type of movement to movement that occur in three directions. When we get to this slide where we'll be describing the movement of this joint, you would see different types of movement that are exhibited by the sternoclavicular joint. And this joint capsule is further lined by a synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane is known to secrete the synovial fluid. So this is what makes it a saddle type of synovial joint. It is saddle because of the alignment of the articular surfaces creating concave and converse alignment, and also the fact that it is able to exhibit by axial type of movement, which of course is transformed by the intraarticular disc to a movement that is exhibited by a both and socket type of joint. And it is also synovial type of joint because the joint cavity is lined by synovial membrane that secretes the synovial fluid. The synovial fluid basically is to nourish the joint and also prevent friction. The fluid will also allow easy movement or sliding of the bones that contribute to the formation of this joint. So this is why we say that it is a saddle type of synovial joint. And we've been able to structurally define the basis behind this saddle type of synovial classification of these joints. So now let's look at the ligaments that help to reinforce this joint. Remember when we started this lecture, we say that the sternal end of the clavicle is bigger than the clavicular notch of the manubrium that is created. And because of this, we need a number of ligaments that will be helping to reinforce or support this joint. And we say that this joint is formed by contribution from three structures. We have the sternal head at this point. We have the clavicular notch of the manubrium at this point. And at this inferior region, we have the first coastal cartilage. So all these three structures will be held together by ligaments. And this is where they will be helping to reinforce this joint. So ligaments that will be describing will be seen to connect one region of this joint to the other. The first ligaments that we'll be looking at here is the sternoclavicular ligaments. This ligament is two in number. We have one in the anterior region and we have one behind. Sternoclavicular ligament is a ligament that runs from the sternum to the clavicle. So using this lower image, this is where we have the fibers of the sternoclavicular ligament. We have one in the anterior region and we have the other one behind. The anterior segment of the sternoclavicular ligament is stronger than the posterior segment. And this is what helps to reinforce this joint in the anterior and the posterior surfaces respectively. The second ligament that we have is the interclavicular ligament. From the name, interclavicular ligament will run from the standard end of one clavicle to the standard end of the other clavicle. And this is how you see the fibers running to and fro the two standard hands of the clavicle. And you see them running through the jugular notch that is created around the middle upper surface of the manubrium, helping to prevent the superior displacement of the clavicle. 
if you look deep into this ligament, you see seem to run from the sternal end of one clavicle to the sternal end of the other clavicle. So running along this path, it is helping to prevent the superior displacement of the clavicle because you see it crossing above the sternoclavicular joint at one side and also on the other side. Then the next ligament that supports the sternoclavicular joint is the costoclavicular ligament. The costoclavicular ligament from the name is seen to run from the clavicle to the costal cartilage. And this costoclavicular ligament is seen to have two lamina. We have the anterior lamina, which runs superior laterally, and this is what is seen to be highlighted here in red. You see the fibers of the anterior lamina running superiorly and also laterally. While we have the posterior lamina running superior medially. And this is what is also projected here in red. So you see it's running superiorly and also directed medially. And this is what tends to create a cone-shaped appearance or configuration of this ligament. What it does basically is to prevent excessive superior clavicular displacement. We have the clavicle located at this upper region and it helps to hold it in place, thereby helping to prevent its superior displacement. So let's look at the grades of movement allowed or exhibited by the sternoclavicular joint. We have elevation and depression. We also have protraction and also retraction. Then we have rotation. So these are the multiple types of movements that are exhibited by the sternoclavicular joint. And remember that this movement is allowed because of the intraarticular disc. Remember the intraarticular disc is what is helping to allow for this grade of movement. So now let's look at the blood supply. The sternoclavicular joint is supplied by branches from the internal thoracic artery and also the suprascapular artery. Let's see how this artery is emerged. This is where we have the half of aorta. We know that from the half of aorta, we have the subclavian artery. It is from the subclavian artery that we have the emergence of the internal thoracic artery that is directed inferiorly along the thoracic cavity. And this is where it gives up branch to supply the sternoclavicular joint. We also have branches from the thyrocervical trunk, which is the suprascapular artery. The suprascapular artery also gives up branches to supply the sternoclavicular joint. For the innervation is, is from the medial supraclavicular nerve. The medial supraclavicular nerve is a branch from the cervical plexus, and it is seen to originate or emerge from the anterior ramine of C3 and C4 cervical spinal nerves. Then we also have the nerve to the subclavius, which is an emergence from the superior trunk of the brachial plexus. And this superior trunk is formed by the root from C5 and C6 cervical spinal nerves. For clinical anatomy, we have dislocation of the sternoclavicular joint, which is a very rare condition. And this tends to happen when there is a strong impact on that region. And it is also important for us to add that in adolescents, that when this occur, fracture can occur along the path where we have the epiphyseal line. In the epiphyseal region, there is a line that connects the epiphysis with the diaphysis. And this line will completely disappear by the age of 25. Fracture can occur along the alignment where we have the creation of the epiphyseal line. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you find this video useful. Please stay tuned to my channel and thanks for watching.